Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming out on a Thursday to come hear me talk about this. This is exciting. I actually haven't been back in uh, Vancouver since probably 2003. I know. Once you turn 21, it's just... Um, but it's wonderful to be back. It really is. And I am excited to give this talk. And I'm actually going to start out by reading a little bit from my upcoming book, because I have a chapter on this subject. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I mean, that's not why you guys are here. But um, I figured, why write something twice when I've already written it? If you travel a lot, you begin to understand the importance of airport food. When you are frazzled, frustrated from long lines, and nervous about your upcoming time and a metal capsule hurtling through the air, airport food can be the much needed pause to collect yourself and feel human, or the final indignity that sends you to tears. And so it was at the airport for my third trip of a very busy week that I thought I'd found the respite that I desired. I had spent the entire week driving from city to city eating fast food and disgusting edible cardboard from gas cartons in my job as a marketing consultant. In the airports, I'd been lucky to find food that hadn't been shipped in prepackaged and then microwaved into a rubbery mass. And I'd have been even luckier if said restaurant sold a glass of wine fresh from the Franzia box. So by the time my last trip of the week had arrived, I was sick to death of travel food. But I'd been running around in meetings all morning and hadn't been able to eat properly before leaving for the airport. After having to return home, 10 minutes after leaving the house, realizing I'd left both my laptop charger and underwear at home. By the way, you guys, I just spent an hour today trying to find a laptop charger because I, that's, that's a thing I do. Um, back to the story. <laughs> I'd fought torturous traffic, stood through long security lines, took off my shoes, stood in the scanners, and finally made it to my gate with my bags, a tiny piece of my sanity, and a cavernous hunger. Having safely located my gate and reassuring myself that I had enough time, I searched for a place to grab a quick bite to eat and a glass of wine. I would catch my breath and board the plane with little less anxiety than it followed me through airport security provided I could find the right place to eat. This was not a gate I was used to. It was far off at the end of a terminal where the nice seated restaurants are often replaced with vending machines, but I had hope. And after a few minutes, I found what I was looking for. I found better than what I was looking for. I found Africa Lounge. Could this be? Had I possibly found African food in a sea of stale bagels? What type of food might it be, West African? Ethiopian? We had a large Ethiopian population in the area. What a great idea to put an African restaurant in the international airport and to showcase to new arrivals some of the ethnic and cultural diversity of the area and to make people of different backgrounds feel more welcome. Also, have you had African food? No matter which region you are sampling, it's delicious. I almost jogged over, smiling in excitement. But as I got closer, the warning signs started to appear. Were those zebra print chairs? Oh no, was that a caveman mural on the wall? My joy was rapidly plummeting. The menu was placed on the placard out front. It took a look with a small bit of remaining hope. Bacon and Swiss burger, hmm, okay, not that. Grilled Italian chicken, nope. I scanned further and quickly saw that there would be no African food. No fry plantain, no kitfa, no igusi soup. This wasn't an African restaurant. It was an American restaurant with African-themed decor, and a pretty sad one at that. And suddenly, I was very sad. I thought of the amazing African food I'd grown up with, and the few African restaurants I'd been able to find in the Pacific Northwest. Food that most white people had probably never reveled in the way I had. Food that wouldn't be able to command the prices that four-star restaurants would, even though just as much time, care, and skill went into its preparation. Restaurants that would always be expected to be a bargain until they were helmed by white chefs who drastically Americanized their menus and called it fusion so they could impress food critics. I thought of the Ethiopian restaurant that my mom's best friend used to own. 
and remembered watching her spread large circles of batter on a griddle to make fermented bread to eat with spiced lentils cooked in butter. I told all of my friends about how great Ethiopian food was, even though I knew that there was a good chance I'd be met with the tired joke, they have food in Ethiopia? I thought of the really amazing Nigerian restaurant I used to go to years ago. It had to shut down because there weren't enough West Africans in the area to bring in the revenue it needed. I had loved taking my eldest son there to a restaurant filled with traditional West African decor. Showing my son how to roll his fufu into round balls and to dip it in his stew. The room smelled like my childhood and the music brought me back to memories of slightly tipsy Nigerian men dancing in my childhood living room, full of jollof rice and happiness. But Nigerian food hadn't been popularized here yet. That is just beginning in the US within the last couple of years. I thought about how great it would be to come across a restaurant like that in an international airport. What a great way to show how international an American city could be. But instead, I was standing in front, instead what I was standing in front of in that airport was a caricature of my culture, a caricature of the vibrant decorations and festive music. Everything I'd loved about African food had been skinned and draped around the shoulders of a glorified McDonald's. This was as close to African food as I was going to get here. And it was going to be served to me by a white man in front of a caveman mural and it would come with nachos. So we are here to talk about cultural appropriation. A lot of people want to know basically what it is. And this is one of those things where, you know, when you're giving a talk sometimes and you're like, oh, we have to start with what it is. And you're like, oh, sit tight. This is going to be boring. It's almost never really boring when we're talking about cultural appropriation because I think the disagreement starts from that very beginning. This is not a subject where everyone's like, I know already, I know. Um, <laughs> it's If you were to ask 20 people what cultural appropriation is, you would get 20 different answers. But the definition we're going to work with here today is the use of part of a marginalized or underprivileged culture by the dominant culture. And here are some lovely examples of, of what that can look like in some of its more egregious forms. Um, that dude is literally titled Zulu Warrior, the uh, frat boy in uh, boxer shorts. This is often done for profit or for entertainment. And oftentimes the culture that is used is distorted by the dominant culture using it. It's often divorced from its greater cultural or historical context. And one very important characteristic is that often the dominant culture has the power to permanently alter the general perceptions of the piece of culture they are appropriating. So it is not just, I borrowed it, I did a weird thing with it. It's, I borrowed it, I did a weird thing with it, and now everyone thinks that weird thing is what it is forever. And lastly, the profit, I think lastly, we'll see. <laughs> the profit or benefit from the use of appropriated culture primary, is primarily reserved for the dominant culture that appropriated it. So when we see people using, let's say, Native American um, textile patterns for clothing, right? The profit from those sales are going to go to the white business owners and designers and not the indigenous people that had created it and depend on it. No, no, I was wrong, there's one more. And also these things can reinforce negative stereotypes about a marginalized culture. What this really comes down to is it's a question of power. This is not necessarily a question of manners or courtesy or niceness. It's a question of power. When two people meet on an even, even playing field, they can bargain as equals. And then whomever decides on what, provided everyone's honest, it's fair. 
But we don't live in a society that has equality. We live in a society where there are various very strong um, power constructs and there are certain groups who have far more power than others. So what is it about cultural appropriation that is so difficult? I didn't see anyone like flinching super hard when I went over the definition. It seems to make sense when I say it, and yet this is a topic we find ourselves talking about way too much. First off, not everyone agrees on what should be protected. Right? What, what belongs to a culture and what's universal? What used to belong to a culture and has been used by everyone for so long it doesn't anymore. What belongs to multiple cultures? What belongs to a culture but it's just not that important? Not every member of a minority culture thinks cultural appropriation is an issue. And I think it's important to re remember that whenever we talk about social issues, especially having to deal with power constructs and oppression, no one is a monolith, and that means that even I'm sitting up here, there, is go there are going to be people, people of color who disagree with everything I am saying. There's also the question of where's the line between appropriation and appreciation? Right? When are you inspired by something versus appropriating something? When are you paying homage to something versus appropriating something? And what about the value of cultural exchange? Here in the West, we really like to put that out there as one of our, you know, our great definers is how often that we, you know, exchange different aspects of culture and we like to think of ourselves as being very cosmopolitan in that sense, right? And we go out to eat at all these different restaurants and we think that says something about who we are as people. It is very ingrained in Western identity to have access and, in, in fact, part ownership of basically every culture you encounter. And it's taught oftentimes as something that is very beneficial to society at large. And what about personal and artistic freedom? And I think this is definitely something that we're seeing a lot in recent controversies here in Canada around cultural appropriation that we've seen, especially in the literary world, right? Is what about me as a writer? You know, what about my freedom to imagine? Isn't that what writers are supposed to do? Aren't we supposed to be rebellious? Aren't we supposed to dare? Aren't we supposed to dream big things? How are we supposed to do that if we have these, if we're put in these boxes? Now, it's coming up a lot. And a lot of people are sick of it. A lot of people just never want to hear the term cultural appropriation again. I would say the terms like check your privilege and cultural appropriation are the two I can say to guarantee to have someone be like, meh, 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 meh. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it is their phrases. And by the way, people, just as few people know what privilege means as cultural appropriation. It's definitely one of those, I don't like that word. It's ruining my party. Get it out of here. And yet we keep talking about it, and it is still an issue. And we talk about it, and the reason why we're talking about it here is because cultural appropriation does do real harm to real people. First, it dehumanizes and disempowers minority cultures. And it does this because when someone else is presenting you and they have the platform, and you don't have a platform to counter that. You are not only being represented, you know, and your power is being stripped away, your identity is being stripped away, but you're also being dehumanized because you are being reduced to whatever imagery the person who has the platform to represent you in any way, even if it's something as small as an item of clothing, you're being reduced to that. You don't get to interject your broader picture into that. Oftentimes, too, because the dominant culture gets to pick and choose which pieces of a minority culture are shown, then the entire dialogue around who someone is is often reduced to what is shown. And I say that as Nigerian who at least, you know, 
nowadays, okay, now that people know who I are, they, who I am, they wouldn't dare. But like before, everywhere I would go and I'd meet someone, chances are it would be at least once a month someone would ask me if I was a Nigerian princess and going to scam them out of all of their money. Because that's the interaction that the dominant culture chooses to highlight about what is the most populous, most highly educated country in Africa. It redefines important parts of minority cultures. So not only does it, do people pick and choose what parts are shown and what aren't, but oftentimes they are completely redefined. We see this often in art, we see this often in music, and this is where it's incredibly dangerous in literature because people form emotional connections to characters and how they're portrayed. And if the only interaction that they're having, the closest interaction they are having with a minority culture is through the character of the book, and that character's culture has been wildly distorted by the imagination of a writer who has very little personal experience with that culture, you're actually redefining that culture for the reader. And it replaces meaningful cultural exchange with cultural voyeurism. And I say this because I am not at all opposed to cultural exchange. I don't think anyone is. But when you can dip in for a day and say that you spent some time imagining yourself as a geisha, and then you leave, you're not actually having a cultural exchange. You're having a daydream. And you're making someone up, and you're making a culture up that already belongs to someone. And that can feel like an accomplishment. That can feel like multiculturalism. And it's not. Everything that you're consuming is still within the lens of a dominant culture but you feel like you've done something. You feel like you've, you've really gone out there and broadened yourself. I know very often I see people will recommend films and books to me that have characters of color. They're like, oh, you would love this. And I'm like, uh, you know, that's all made up and that's not a real person, <laughs> that's not how that is. But, but they think that they have learned some great things. People will even quote to me characters from books, African characters written by white people to show how much they understand what I'm talking about. But they don't, because the writer didn't understand what I'm talking about. And there is meaningful culture exchange to be had, but it kind of gets cut off when you run into someone who thinks they already know, and they actually don't need anything from you. They don't need to listen. They don't need to actually exchange with you. They got everything they needed out of this film or out of this book. It alienates minority consumers. I think this is something that gets lost a lot when we talk about cultural appropriation. But the truth is, is people of color, they like to buy things too, and they like to enjoy things too. And they like to go to movies that maybe don't have caricatures of their culture. They like to read books that don't have caricatures of their culture. They like, you know, they would like to wear fashion that isn't actually stealing money from the people in their culture who could themselves be making authentic pieces of clothing and supporting their family with it. And they are cut out of the picture. We talk a lot about, well, if, the, you know, if people didn't want it, we wouldn't make it. But what about all of the people who never even get a chance to say anything? They're already cut out of the experience. And with, with reading, this is, I love to read. And it's, it's shocking how often you kind of get kicked as you're reading through something and you're enjoying it. And then there's this blatant caricature of a person in there. And, and you're like, oh, this too? I can't, I can't just read an article and get through it <laughs> without you know, feeling like I'm being insulted at the same time. Right? Your consumers are more than just the dominant culture. I mean, unless you want to start putting that on the covers of your books and magazines, only for the dominant culture. 
I mean, and, and I won't have a problem with that. I just will know better. <laughs> I just don't think that's what you're going for. It takes away opportunities for minority populations. And we're talking about this as well. Right? People like to consume things in a way in which they're most comfortable. And oftentimes, that means if you can put a middle class, white, straight, cis face on it, and still call it diversity, that's gonna be what people go to. There are people who will never get the opportunity to show their mastery of their cultural skills, or the various treasures that their culture has come up with, simply because there are half-assed replicas out there that suffice. And it's unjust. I mean, it's just a basic, it's just, it's just not fair. And this may seem like the thing that sounds childish or counterproductive, but the truth is, is that if you are a part of an oppressed population in a society and every day you are punished for walking around in your culture, visibly walking around in your skin and in your hair and in your faith, it's just not fair that people who never have to face that get to pluck out the prettiest parts of what you've made out of that and enjoy it. It's just, it's not fair. So let's talk about what cultural appropriation isn't. It's not a way to get back at white people. It's not every single use of any part of a minority culture by the dominant culture. It's not absolutely everything. And it's, there's no such thing as reverse cultural appropriation, right? You know the saying, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock landed on us. You can't really appropriate a culture that's been shoved on you. It doesn't work the opposite way. People like to like, oh, well, if you straighten your hair, aren't you appropriating white people? First off, no, because there are plenty of cultures <laughs> that aren't white that have straight hair. Um, also, just no, that's just not how this works. And it's not a crime. So we can really not, we can let go of talk of censorship. Censorship is actually a legal thing. Right? It's actually people punishing you, the government coming in and saying, you cannot write this, you cannot say this, you will be fined or you will have jail time. Someone saying, I don't want to buy your magazine because I don't like what you said, doesn't mean you've been censored. Even an editor saying, I don't want to publish this because it's not a good fit, doesn't mean you've been censored. What does cultural appropriation look like in a literary world? Here's a couple of recent well-known examples. So this is a children's book um, that came out in 2015 called A Fine Dessert. And this is a story about um, a, two slaves a, who are making, a girl and her mother who are making, um, a, I believe it's a blueberry fool for their slave masters and eating it in the hiding in the closet to lick the bowl after they're done. And it's basically like this heartwarming, cheerful story about being a slave and having to eat in a closet. Um, here's the text from part of that page. After waiting the table at supper, where the master and his family ate turtle soup, roast turkey, corn cakes, and sweet potatoes, they spooned the blackberry full into yellow dishes and served it. Later, the girl and her mother hid in the closet and licked the bowl clean together. Mmm, 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 what a fine dessert. Now, chances are, if you were to ask a black person to write a children's book about slavery, this is not how it would go. Because this does not, this is not what it was like. <laughs> also, this, this is not something that helps 
white children reading it know anything about what slavery was like? It certainly doesn't help black children when they're trying to understand why the world is the way it is today. It does set up things though, I don't know if you guys have seen what this looks like in the adult world. The amount of people who will try and tell you that slavery wasn't as bad as it really was. And at least they were fed. At least they got medical care. This is what it looks like starting early. This is what reinforces it for our children. So when they hear these stories, right, or when they hear about, you know, Thomas Jefferson being in love with a slave instead of what he was doing, which was raping a woman, it, it makes sense to them. This was, I don't know if you guys heard about When We Was Fierce, which just is so cringing even from the beginning. Um, this was a book that didn't come to market. It was pulled, I think maybe a week before it was supposed to come out because a black person finally got to read it. And they were like, what's happening here? Uh, this was a young adult novel, um, a drama about street kids. And um, luckily, one of the few black people who got a chance to look at it before it came out um, put some excerpts of dialogue up online in her review. I was mid-speak when I got an interrupt. My think go to racing. I don't know what these things mean, you guys. So you aren't worried about catch and speak with Nacho? We just hold in time. Don't talk slaves to me. This is dialogue that young black men are supposedly saying to each other in this inner city drama. And this is made for young adults. This is made for high schoolers. Now, if you read this and you think that you understand anything about inner city black culture, if this is the one book you read in 10th grade that has black characters in it, what are you going to think about black people in general? And if you are a black person looking for black characters in the book and this is what you pick up, what are you going to think about what the world thinks about you in general? And also, it's just a really shitty book. Like, this is really... <laughs> Yes, this is unreadable. It doesn't make sense. Like, if you're going to make up dialogue, like, it should make sense. Here's some examples from magazines. How to, Twisted Mini Buns, uh, inspired by Marc Jacobs. If, if, you, if you guys don't know what these are, these are Bantu knots. It's a very traditional black hairstyle. It's one that you actually can't wear outside without getting mocked relentlessly by white people or people at least thinking that you've given up, or you're lazy, or maybe you're there's something slightly off about you. It's the hairstyle they gave, crazy eyes, on orange is the new black. Um, but it becomes twisted mini buns when it's high fashion for a night. Now, now that we, we've talked about what this is, there's a reason why I, why I have this talk, and it's not because I mean, I do want everyone to understand what cultural appropriation is. I do want people to understand why it's important. But I also want to kind of shift this conversation because what happens time and time again is the conversation boils down to the specifics. Well, can I write this? Can I wear this? What if my kid really likes Moana? Can she dress up as Moana for Halloween? What if she doesn't put on brown makeup? Can she still wear a hula skirt? And we end up having these conversations about specifics, and then you'll have someone who says that's fine, someone who says, no, that's a huge problem. And it's no wonder that people get frustrated and people get annoyed, right? Because every one of our day-to-day -day tasks, we can stop and ask, is this appropriative? It's important to remember, cultural appropriation is fundamentally an issue of representation and power. It is not the act of borrowing from a cult another culture itself that is a cultural appropriation. It is the power dynamic at play. Right, so if I meet someone, like I said, on an even playing field, and I'm like, can I borrow this? 
if I don't ask, I might be a jerk. I'm not necessarily, it's not cultural appropriation. It's the power dynamic itself. It's not even the act itself. And I think a lot of times people feel, start feeling really bad because they're like, wait a minute, you know, I love jazz and I've just been playing jazz because I love it so much and now you're telling me I'm evil and I'm doing a thing. It's the power dynamic that matters. As long as there is a large disparity in power and representation any cultural borrowing of a minority culture by a dominant culture runs the risk of being appropriative and harmful. Abstaining from the act of cultural appropriation will not on its own make a measurable impact on the power and representation disparities in our society. Now I'm saying this because we need to understand the bigger picture the bigger issue, issue is not a word to me. Um, we are talking about cultural appropriation because of what causes it and what it reinforces. So without this disparity in power and representation, cultural appropriation just doesn't exist. You just have people borrowing and people sharing. And we also have to remember that because it is caused by the system, stopping cultural appropriation doesn't actually do anything to the system. And I say this because when we look at cultural appropriation, we have to think of it as a symptom that makes things worse, but it's still a symptom. You know, like I said, if you have, you know, if you have cancer, and it makes you vomit, you can treat the nausea. You're still going to die of cancer, right? But you can kind of do both. No sense in saying, well, I'm treating cancer, you know, I'm going to ignore everything else. You do both, and you look at both, and you have to. And you can't say, you know, I just took some anti-nausea meds. It's done. I fixed it. So which question here is better? How do we get people to stop talking about cultural appropriation so we can go back to doing whatever we want? <laughs> Where can I get a list of exactly what is or isn't culturally appropriative? How do we prove to minorities that cultural appropriation is a good thing? You guys are laughing like this question hasn't been asked before. It's been asked a billion times. How do we protect white writers and editors from angry social justice warriors? Or how do we remove the power and representation imbalances that make cultural appropriation a problem at all? And I made it blue, because that's the one. <laughs> when we look at how to end the conditions that create cultural appropriation, we see that cultural appropriation is a symptom of a problem that is so much larger than the appropriation itself. And we see that addressing the issues that enable cultural appropriation are required of any entity that claims to care about equity and justice in our society. So what I'm saying here, y'all, is if you are sick of talking about cultural appropriation, then you'll work on the system that enables cultural appropriation. In a society where minority creators are given control over the creations, cultural appropriation is not an issue. In a society where minority culture is as valued as a dominant culture, cultural appropriation is not an issue. In a society where the profit from minority cre creations primarily benefits minority cultures, cultural appropriation is not an issue. In a society where the products of and by minority cultures are just as visible as the products of and by majority cultures, cultural appropriation isn't an issue. And I am not talking about some fancy pie in the sky utopia. We are culture makers here in the work that we do. Every day we choose what to or not to put out in the world. And in that, we are making a decision whether we are going to pick up our piece of this work or not. What does this look like in the literary world? 
Well, it looks like diverse editors. And I put diverse editors before diverse writers because I think that we forget how incredibly important diverse editors are. And I say this as a black writer who has worked with two black editors my entire writing career, ever. I've only had the opportunity to work with two. Editors help pick what does and doesn't get written. They help enable writers to stay true to their voice. And they also stop writers from dominant culture of making complete asses of themselves. Right? There, are, there are plenty of times where I read something and knowing the way in which writing works, where I don't get mad at the writer, I think, ah, oh, that editor should have really stopped them from doing that. Because we all know that's where the buck stops when it comes to what does and doesn't get published. It does look like diverse writers, and not just for quote unquote ethnic stories. Right? Diverse people interact with all parts of the world, which means I'm tired of getting an email whenever Beyonce does something. I want, you, I mean, I will still write about that. But you know, I still go about my day and do non-Beyonce related things. <laughs> Diverse imagery. And this is, so beyond the words, right? The structures, the layouts, the sound, the images you're using. Diversity matters there. Diverse stakeholders. I know plenty of people whose hands are tied by the vision that is very, very specifically rich and white. I was in a meeting um, the other day, a theater group asked me to talk with them. They were looking to diversify um, their main director. They were hiring a new director. And they invited all these people of color in to help us come up with questions you know, that would in, you know, entice more people of color to apply and questions that we could ask in the interview and kind of traits that we would look for for, for directors of color. In the end, I said, okay, cool. Who's interviewing the directors? They said, oh, our board. I said, what's the makeup of your board? And it was like, oh, we have one person of color, I think. Right? The stakeholders, the people who make these decisions, are invested in a different vision. They, even if they think they're invested in the proper vision, they don't have the lived experience to actually know what that looks like. Sensitivity readers. Yes, you can actually write about things that have to do with other cultures if you do so responsibly. Sensitivity readers can go far. They can't fix everything. They really can't. And don't put that on one, one poor sensitivity reader. But I see a lot of pushback against sensitivity readers, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. Why would you not want someone to stop you from getting yelled at a whole lot on the internet? Like, why, if you could give a little money to someone and they could stop you from getting dragged on Twitter, why would that be a bad thing? Uh, I, I use sensitivity readers. Anytime I'm, I'm reaching outside of my lane and in my book, like I have a chapter on the model minority myth. I, if, there was no way in hell I was gonna go to publishing without a sensitivity reader on that, just to make sure I didn't step in something. And not only because I don't like being dragged on Twitter, I also just don't like harming people and putting harmful and inaccurate shit out into the world. Less imagination, more collaboration. I think we get a lot of hubris in the power of our imagination as writers. And we really do think we can imagine ourselves into a culture that already exists. We can imagine a culture. You can imagine a new society. You can imagine an alien society. You can't imagine a society that already exists. It's already been made. And that's where collaboration helps. And collaboration is rewarding. I mean, not only are you writing something better, something that rings true, something that can appeal to a broader audience, including the audience that may come from the culture that you're writing about, 
but you just, you learn more, you have a greater knowledge base. And then when you are imagining a whole new society, you have more to draw from. We need a reevaluation of gatekeepers. Who decides what is good writing and what is bad writing? Who decides what's good grammar and bad grammar? A lot of these things actually keep diverse writers out of the industry. I don't know how many times I've had working with writers of color, especially um, immigrants, who have incredibly important and valuable things to say about what's going on in society today. And I can't get them past the gate of editors because the way in which they structure a sentence is influenced by their culture, and it's not considered proper English by the editors. And they assume that they are not good writers, and they don't even respond to their pitches. We have to evaluate, reevaluate who is gatekeeping our language, which, by the way, is what I'm going to be talking about tomorrow in much more in-depth. But we really do have to look at what we are calling good film and bad film, what we're calling good writing and bad writing, what we're calling good journalism and bad journalism. And we have to challenge the dominant default, right? The default of dominant culture, and so for you know, where I interact in my day-to-day life would be white culture. The default is always going to be whiteness, even when people are diversifying. It's usually the main character is a white person, and it's how they ran into this person of color, and then the person of color taught them some things about the world, and then they were better for it. The end, everyone's staring at a white person the whole time. We have to challenge that default. We have to look at the way in which we expect everything to come from a certain group and to to center a certain group in order for us to be able to relate to it. And I think a lot of times this is why it is so much more profitable for someone from a dominant culture to reinterpret a different culture than it is for someone from that culture to actually speak their truth because we are so used to things coming through this lens that even if it's not accurate anymore, it's still the package we want it in. And we have to start challenging that. And we also need to have an awareness of the role that economic exploitation has played in the creation and maintenance of systemic oppression. We have to remember that when we are making money off of things from a culture that has been systemically oppressed. We are furthering the economic exploitation that has created and upheld their oppression. Right. One of the primary, you know, especially when it comes to racial oppression, one of the primary pillars of it has been economic exploitation. Right. Stealing the labor, stealing the products, And you can't say that you appreciate that culture and then continue to cut them out of any revenue from what comes out of that. And we have to take that very seriously. This also means we have to proactively look at paying people for their culture. So it's not just, I am no longer going to steal for you. It is, I value you, I will pay for you to create these things. I will pay for your goods and services because they are of value. It is not just we no longer have white rappers anymore because we don't do that. It is I care about rap. I am going to start paying to support black rappers, right? What does ending cultural appropriation actually get you? A reduction in implicit bias. Studies have shown the more you actually know about a culture, the more that you can tell the nuances of culture, the less implicit bias you'll have. When all we are given is this surface level look into people, all it does is actually reinforce our implicit bias. It allows our imaginations to run free with the worst of whatever it is we hear about people. We, I actually just wrote an article last week, I think, for Today's Parent, showing studies with young children that when they were taught to actually recognize the differences in faces of black people, their features, their skin tones, things like that, their implicit bias after two 20-minute sessions 
was measurably, drastically reduced for over 60 days just from being able to see more about the culture. And that applies throughout our society. We have to actually see people and see how they live, hear through their own words, have them represent themselves and appreciate that and get to know it in order to reduce all of the static and all of these lies that we are constantly being fed and all of the weird things that our imagination will come up with when we encounter an unknown. Economic justice. Right? If we ever want to actually tackle the economic disparities in our society, it does mean that people are going to have to be able to profit off of their goods and services. We get more harm-free collaboration. When we know that we are centering our work in honesty and integrity and actually seeing people, we can actually come together and work together in a way that's less likely to end up in tears and less likely to do harm in general. When I know that I'm sitting down with a counterpart who wants my input, not so that they can take it and twist it and turn it into something else, but because they want me to own that piece, they want me to bring that authenticity to the work, it's a much more enjoyable collaboration to have. And I would love to see more writers actively do that. And it helps support the preservation of necessary and beautiful cultural practices and creations. The truth is, is a lot of our arts die because the people who do it can't afford to do it anymore. Or because it just isn't appreciated anymore because you can buy a knockoff of it at Target. More innovation. Instead of just being limited to your own lived experience and trying to imagine out of that, you can actually see all of the various ways in which other people are doing things. And then you can come together and come up with new ideas and be more creative. I, there's a reason why like, when I watch Game of Thrones, like you can imagine a whole new society. It's basically just a whole new world of white people. Because if you don't spend a lot of time <laughs> around a lot of people, even your imagination is going to be limited. If you don't spend a lot of time with authentic voices, even when you are stretching as hard as you, there's a reason why Doctor Who can regenerate into a thousand different white dudes. Right? He's an alien who can turn into anything. He doesn't even have to look human. But no, he's just a quirky white dude. I mean, we're finally getting a white woman coming up, right? That's, just, that's the biggest stretches we can get. And every alien on there that's a good alien looks very human, right? Because we don't know how to stretch as far as we think we do. <laughs> and we do that by honestly consuming more, by consuming more authentic voices. If you're just saying, I want every writer to just be able to imagine the world, we're just gonna have 7,000 Doctor Whos and then we're gonna read it all and we're all gonna have the same thing and we're gonna think that's progress. We get more innovation when we listen to all of the different ways that actual people are doing things. Better art. That's what this leads to. It leads to far better art. If you spend your whole life revering something, but then what you're studying from is like, you know, a replica of a replica of a replica, it's not going to be as good. There is something about the authenticity in, way, in the way in which things were created that matters. Even in writing, right? The authenticity of lived experience. When we pull from ourselves, even in, in journalism, even when you're interviewing someone, when you're pulling from your lived experience and you're meeting someone and they're giving their lived experience, that's so much better than if you're just trying to make one up. You're trying to create a construct with which to relate, relate to someone. We get better art out of it. And from that, we do create a broader and more vibrant culture to draw from. We have better writing, which I was just talking about. We do. We just, we get better writing because everything doesn't sound the same. And that matters. 
It matters to, to come across language that you hadn't considered, sentence structures you hadn't considered, slang you hadn't considered. Right? New ways of communicating lived experience. If you want to write about what it's like to grow up poor, and there are 50 different ways in which people grew up poor, it's interesting to be able to read them all. Instead of just one way, told through you know, 20 different skin tones, but the writer is just going through the one way they always knew. Right? Reading all of these things, learning all the different things, this will inspire you and make you a better writer and elevating other writers will just give you like a cooler office space. I don't work in an office, I work in my bedroom, but I still consider other writers like my coworkers. And I'm constantly wondering what I can do to have a more vibrant workspace, right? To have different voices I can read and be like, damn, I never thought of that. That's fascinating, that's amazing. And it doesn't happen when everyone's coming from one experience even if you're trying to imagine something else. You're limited by what you know. We have artists that can afford to continue creating. This is really important. If you are inspired by other cultures, then you should be very alarmed by how many creators of color are being forced out of that work because they cannot make a living. and a more informed and enriched audience. I think a lot of times we are afraid of our audience. We think that if we put things out there, especially in things like magazines and radio, we think that if we put things out there and we don't filter it for our audience, we don't translate it for our audience, they will be turned off because they can't relate. And I think we actually need to give our audience a little more credit for their ability to stretch and their ability to empathize and their ability to be a little uncomfortable and know that it's worth it. We cannot forever insulate our audience from the authentic voices of other cultures. We, we don't need to spoon feed it to them. It's okay, it's okay to not know a word. I've been reading um, books by Daniel Jose Oder. Do you, do you all know who he is? Fascinating writer, primarily young adult books. Um, and he, he writes fantasy novels, and they're set in New York. And um, the lead character in two of his books is an Afro-Latina woman. And there's words in there in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish. I can still keep reading. And I think it's important to have a moment where it's not about me, it's not all for me, to remember, oh yeah, this is, a, this is not my culture. This is a different experience. This is an authentic experience. And when you're sitting with your friends in your neighborhood, you don't translate everything you say. And I think it's very important for teenagers and young adults reading those books, or 36-year-olds reading those books, to have that experience as well and know that they can still enjoy a novel. They're great, by the way. You should totally read them. I love them. And you get an experience of authenticity. The truth is, is that people really do respond to authenticity. I don't know if you've seen the difference when something comes out that's pure and real from culture, but people glom onto it. It's fresh and it's new and they want more. And we forget that. <laughs> we forget that, that that's a real thing that you can profit off of um, if you were looking at the bottom line. Is the truth is, is that audiences are just as bored as many writers are. So actually put some authenticity in there. And in, this, in the internet, when there's so much of it is lies and so much of it is bullshit, something that's true, like it's like a beacon. And lived experience, true lived experience, shines. People recognize it. A lot of times they don't even know they've been missing it until they see it. Some tips while you work to end cultural appropriation, because I am assuming that y'all are gonna work on this. Here's a safe bet for you, because we will never be able to all agree on what exact actions are or are not appropriative. If you can use a part of a minority culture and be rewarded for it by society, 
in a way or to a degree that someone from that minority culture would not be able to, it's probably appropriation. Believe people. If someone comes to you and says that what you are doing is harming them, do not ask them to prove it. Do not ask them to work their way through all your objections. Believe that they are people who are capable of interpreting their lived experience to you and respect that. Don't be an asshole. It's really hard when you're called out for something to not be an asshole. It's like, and I get it, even if you're not an asshole every day, it's really hard to not be one, but don't. Be kind, be considerate. Know that someone is actually making themselves vulnerable by telling you that something is impacting them. Be prepared for ambiguity and stay focused on the overall goal. Like I said, we're never going to ever agree on what is or isn't appropriative as far as individual actions. And you have to be prepared for that. You have to be prepared that even if you are 90% sure that what you're doing isn't appropriative, that someone will think it is. Or when you are not doing something because you're sure it's appropriative, someone, even from that culture, is going to say, no, it's fine, go ahead. Err on the side of not harming people and know that your overall goal is still focused on the system. Prioritize the humanity of minorities over the comfort of the majority. So even if it kind of ruins your day that you can't wear that headdress to Coachella, understand you know, that your slightly less cool fashion is far less important than the dignity and the humanity of the people who find that headdress sacred and really don't want you puking on it. Like literally. And remember, there is a lot of unfairness when it comes to cultural appropriation. Your inability to wear a feathered headdress at Coachella is really, really far down that list. We are talking about a system that's inherently unfair and we have to have priorities within it. Remember, you have literally everything else. If you are having conversations about cultural appropriation and you are the one in fear of appropriating the culture because you are in the dominant culture, you have everything else. We talk about this at Halloween and what costumes you can or can't wear and it always is so frustrating to me because as a black person, as a kid, do you know how hard it is to like explain that you're Cinderella but you're black, but you're Cinderella? Like I had like two costumes I could wear but someone's mad because they can't, you know, dress up as a geisha. Fine, you have everything else. You have every Disney character almost. You have every you know, movie character. You've got basically every historical figure that's taught in our schools. You have everything else. Be happy with everything else. So that's my presentation. And if you guys want to find me on Twitter, that's where you can find me. And my book comes out in January.